In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This Sunday is particularly dedicated to the virtue of faith. The doubting Thomas the Apostle, not believing the testimony of the holy women, uh, nor of the apostles themselves, who had seen our Lord, demanded to see Christ himself before he would agree that he rose from the dead. Our Lord had already rebuked the other apostles for not having accepted the testimony of the witnesses, namely the holy women, who first saw the empty tomb and spoke to the angels. St. Thomas, however, has a special guilt inasmuch as he will not even accept the testimony of his fellow apostles. He has also forgotten the many times in which our Lord predicted his resurrection from the dead. In other words, he has a lack of faith. Our Lord's words to him, blessed are they that have not seen and have believed, actually define for us what is the virtue of faith, for it is to believe without seeing. It is to give the full and certain assent of our minds to a truth which does not have any evidence except that someone tells us that it is true. Now, every single day we make natural acts of faith. We believe what we are told in news reports, at least concerning major things like volcanoes or wars. We believe the labeling on cans and medicines. We believe that people are who they say they are. The faith, however, which is required of us in order to please God is a supernatural faith, a divine gift to our intellects, whereby we adhere with perfect certitude to the truths which God has revealed concerning himself. This we do because we understand them as if they were, excuse me, we do not understand them as if they were a mathematical problem, seeing the, the sense of it, or as if we saw these things with our own eyes, but we adhere to them purely on the testimony of God revealing. Faith, therefore, is not a trust in God, as the Protestants make it, or some feeling of adherence to God, but is instead a very unemotional assent of the intellect to truths which have a divine guarantee. How do we know that these truths come from God? because the Catholic Church proposes them through her infallible magisterium. How do we know that the Catholic Church is from God? How do we know that it speaks in the name of God? First, we know that Christ intended to found a church and that it would last until the end of time. Behold, I am with you all days, he said, even to the consummation of the world. These words of Christ indicate that the church would survive the death of the apostles and would endure until the end of time. Consequently, the church of Christ must be somewhere upon the face of the earth. Second, we can identify this church by comparing the organizations which claim to be the church of Christ to the church which Christ intended. And if we examine in the Holy Gospel the church which Christ intended, we see in it four characteristics, and these are the four marks of the church, one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Only the Catholic Church meets these criteria. The others do not measure up. Third, Roman Catholicism corresponds to all of the truths of natural religion. That is, those truths that we can learn from reason, where we look around at creation and deduce certain truths about God, both dogmatic and moral. So 
the, the Catholic Church teaches all of these things and does not contradict any of the truths of natural religion. Fourth, the Roman Catholic religion teaches doctrines which are holy and has never taught a single doctrine which is contrary to revelation or to good morals. Its moral code is the highest of any religion on the face of the earth and always has been. It is the only re religion not to permit divorce and remarriage. <clears throat> Fifth, Roman Catholicism fulfills all of the aspirations and hopes of mankind concerning the living of a virtuous life on earth and the attainment of eternal happiness in heaven. And sixth, the Ch Catholic Church has proven itself to be the true Church of Christ because of its marvelous life, inasmuch as it has preserved sacred doctrine for centuries without the slightest deviation or contradiction, and has withstood persecution by its enemies, both from without and from within. It has endured the sins occasionally of its own faithful or worse, its own clergy and has emerged therefrom with greater vigor and has propagated itself with amazing speed, energy, strength, and perseverance, despite obstacles which, from the natural point of view, are insurmountable. It has divine protection, in other words. These and other signs point out to anyone who approaches the Church with a reasonable mind that the Catholic Church, and it alone, is the true mouthpiece of God and that its testimony concerning God must be believed. The truths of the faith, by their very nature, are absolute and unchanging because God is absolute and unchanging. They are also sacred, as sacred as the very essence and holiness of God from which they emanate. Our assent to these truths is a form of worship of the true God. It is, in fact, the first and essential step toward true worship. For we cannot please God without the assent of faith to the dogmas of the Catholic Church. St. Paul said, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Our Lord said to Pilate, for this was I born, and for this came I into the world, that I should give testimony to the truth. He therefore declares the importance of adhering to the truth since it is the motive of his coming into the world. The ascent of faith to divine truth, therefore, is the first step toward redemption. And without it, no redemption and no sanctification is possible. Our Lord had to die because of divine truth. The Jews said to Pilate, we have a law, and according to the law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. And that's what moved Pilate. Pilate did not pay attention to the first two accusations, which was first that he was a Galilean rabble-rouser. The second was that he said that you should not pay tribute to Caesar. He paid no attention to those things because he knew that the Pharisees were liars, and that's in sacred scripture. But this moved him because he saw that this was the real reason why they brought him to him. And that they were going to rise up against him unless Pilate gave this sentence of death. So it was the Jews that called for his crucifixion because he made himself the son of God. In other words, he paid the price of death for his truth. 
The Catholic Church, being guided as it is by the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Ghost, has always understood the importance of teaching the truth and of adhering to it as an essential part of its mission. For this reason, the Catholic Church has been always perfectly consistent in its teachings and has always guarded the purity of the faith by the condemnation of heresy and by the ejection of heretics from the church. In so doing, it has preserved the unity of faith, one of its essential unities, indeed the most basic of its three unities, namely unity of faith, unity of government, and unity of worship. The faith is the foundation of the whole Catholic building. And we profess this unity of faith of the Catholic Church when we say in the creed, we believe in one church. The church has seen many heresies in the course of its long existence, but it has never seen a heresy which denies the very notion and possibility of truth. Such a heresy is the one that we face today. It goes under many names, relativism, subjectivism, skepticism, pluralism, it's all the same, call it what you want. It is to say that truth has no domain outside of our own minds. What's true for me may not be true for you. And whatever we hold to be true we hold as a purely personal conviction which has no public force or value. Such a system strips from truth an essential characteristic with the result that we think or that what we think or believe are not truths at all but are subjective fantasies. For truth, by its very nature, is the conformity of the mind to the object. It's like a camera. It takes a picture. If everyone has his own camera and takes a picture of the same thing, everyone will have the same picture because the camera is made for the object. So the mind is made for the object. And that's why you have objective truth. Strip this objectivity from truth and you destroy truth itself. Owing to this objectivity, truth by its very nature rejects and destroys the false. That is, whatever contradicts it. So to say God exists, for example, rejects and destroys the proposition God does not exist. Those two things cannot be at the same time in your mind. You cannot assent to both things at the same time. It is impossible. Your mind rebels because they contradict the one and the other. By analogy, light by its very nature excludes darkness. A light which does not exclude darkness is no light at all. Because the faith concerns religious truth revealed by God, its objectivity is all the more enhanced since its certitude is absolute and unalterable. It comes from God himself who is subsistent truth. Adherence to the truths of the faith, therefore, is a worship of God. It is a recognition of his truth as pertaining to his divine essence. Consequently, the recognition of the objectivity of his truth is an essential part of divine worship. This is to say, in a word, that the Catholic faith is not some mere personal conviction, like some political ideas, but it is divinely revealed, absolutely certain and thoroughly objective truth 
which must be accepted by all under pain of eternal damnation. It is the law of God that we believe these things. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Relativism came to us from Protestantism. Protestantism says that every man, when he reads sacred scripture, is inspired by the Holy Ghost to know its true meaning. That's known as free interpretation of the scriptures. No pope is going to tell me what to think. If this were really true, then everyone who reads scripture would hold to the same truths. Because if the spirit of truth is inspiring you with regard to the true interpretation of the piece of scripture that you're reading, then would not everyone believe the same thing if he's inspired by the spirit of truth? Would that not be true? Of course it would. But the opposite occurred. For as many Protestants as there were and are, there were and are interpretations. And so the Protestants split up. And the ecumenical movement actually comes to us from the Protestants who have been trying to put themselves back together like Humpty Dumpty for the past 500 years, trying to find common grounds to put themselves together. But they can't because their very principle is divisive. because they disagree about what the scriptures say. I recently was talking to a man who fixes our printer, and his son is a Protestant minister. And this man that fixes our printer is very conservative. And he said, oh, I'm so upset. I did not go to the ordination, that's what they call it, of my son. Why? Because he believes that in the first chapter of Romans, St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, that St. Paul does not condemn sodomy. Now, if you go to that first chapter of Romans, you'll see that he condemns it in black and white, that it's so clear that no one could ever have any kind of thinking other than that. Everyone knows it. So I said to him, well, what about free examination of the scriptures? He said, well, not for things like that, which, of course, is totally inconsistent. See, if you can pick up the scriptures and, and think opposite of what it says, you're free to do that, right? From this insanity came the idea that truth is merely a personal thing so that no one can impose his own truth on someone else. It is also necessary in this system to respect another's truth, however different from your own. So you might disagree about a sodomitic marriage, for example, but you respect the, the ideas of others, and if they think it's all right, well, then uh, we respect what you think. And we accept your uh, same-sex spouse. That's what you are supposed to do, to be a good liberal citizen today. By the 18th century, this pernicious doctrine became the mainstream of popular thought, and even among some Catholics. It was especially formulated by the philosopher Immanuel Kant, who was a Lutheran. The idea gained traction in the 19th and 20th centuries, especially as man cared less about religion and more about money and inventions. It fit the modern world perfectly. Who cares about religion? Just go out and make money and, and develop science. We'll have more inventions. So religion took a back seat in society. 
Uh, it's a personal thing. Vatican II set out to conform the church to the modern world. It, that was its whole purpose. This conformity took place principally by relativizing Catholic dogma, by applying the absurdity of Protestantism to the structures of Catholicism, which structures were, were built to radiate divine and utterly objective, absolute and unchanging truth to the whole world. All of the structures of the Catholic Church, whether her juridical structures or her physical structures, were made to promulgate and to preserve these absolutely unchanging truths that she received from our Lord Jesus Christ. That's their whole purpose. This relativization of Catholic dogma took place in the form of ecumenism, which says that non-Catholic religions have a value in the order of salvation, an alternate way to go to heaven, in other words. It, the council says they are means of salvation. Why is this so? Because according to the tenets of relativism, the Catholic Church has no right to impose its own creeds and dogmas upon others, but only to display them as if in a tent at a public fair. If you would like some, take some. As one of many paths to God. From what has been said, it is clear that ecumenism is a dogma killer and a faith killer. It destroys the essence of divine truth, and it destroys, because it destroys, its objectivity. Destroy the objectivity of truth, and you destroy truth. Destroy the objectivity of 2 plus 2 equals 4, and you destroy all mathematics. All of the effects of Vatican II can be seen in this relativization of truth. The new mass is the effect of ecumenism, since it eliminates from Catholic worship anything that is offensive to Protestantism. It is a mass of generic Christianity. There is among the modernists no longer any unity of faith. You can believe whatever you want I was talking to a Novus Ordo priest recently, and he said, artificial birth control is commonly accepted by everyone. You don't even talk about it anymore, and most of the childbearing couples are using artificial birth control. That's just a, an accepted thing in the Novus Ordo. It's a mortal sin. You go to hell for that. And it's listed among the same sins in the moral theology theology book as sodomy. That is a perversion of what pertains to marriage, what pertains to nature, a perversion. The same thing, but that's okay because you decide. It's not the church that tells you what to believe. You decide. Religious liberty is also a natural consequence of all of this relativism. That is that the Catholic faith does not have the right to exclude error in society, but must take its place side by side with false religions and even protect and promote their right to promulgate themselves. It's in Vatican II. It's in the decree on religious liberty. So the creator of the world and king, our Lord Jesus Christ, does not have the right to impose his truths in society, but must recognize the false religions that have risen up against him and which draw human beings to hell by their very nature. Those things must be recognized. That's a blasphemy, but it is Vatican II. And it's all based on the relativism. The collegiality of bishops is another result, since it is the elimination, virtually, of the papacy, which 
of course, pleases the Protestants and the Eastern schismatics, all in the name of ecumenism, which is merely relativism. The natural practical effect of relativism is pluralism, which is commonly called tolerance. Pluralism is a sauce which is placed on every truth which instantly relativizes it. So we hear of Catholic politicians who say, I am personally against abortion, but I cannot stop anyone who believes in it from getting one. Tolerance is considered the greatest virtue today, the highest form of charity by which we approve of or at least permit everything in the name of relativism, every kind of thinkable perversion. You accept because that's the virtue of tolerance. The true notion of tolerance is to not punish an evil in order to obtain a greater good or to avoid a worse evil. But in some cases, to tolerate an evil is a grave sin of imprudence. Tolerance is not always a good idea. We understand from what I have said that the modern world has a new God and a new religion, which is that of relativism. <clears throat> It has one simple dogma, that there is no objective truth. Its moral code is pluralism, or at least tolerance, to permit every moral aberration under the sun, no matter how evil it is. And we are seeing this relativism in action in our political world by the approval of sodomitic marriages and transgenderism. These things are against nature, and everybody knows that. Liberals know that. Democrats know that. It's against nature. But, you see, we cannot say that nature really is objective. If you're inclined to do something, well, maybe that's natural. See, and how, who am I to say that nature is objective? or that there is an objective normal. It, so the relativism, therefore, demands that society approve of it. It is only consistent because it is so obviously contrary to everything decent and basic in human beings, however, society's approval of this horrid sin shows an almost unbelievable perversion of the human intellect. As perverse as those acts are, the perversion of the intellect to approve of those things is actually worse. You saw in Oregon not too long ago that there could be more than one right answer to the math problem. That perversion of the intellect, that two plus two perhaps is five, is so, is so bad, is so evil, that is worse than any kind of physical perversion that you could commit. And why is this so? Because the mind is made more for objective truth then male is made for female. In other words, the object or, or the, the tendency of the mind to adhere to truth is greater than the tendency of male and female to be attracted to each other. The mind is made for truth, and the mind is made in the image and likeness of God. I have come to witness unto the truth. Those who are of the truth hear my word. Relativism is, the natural, in the, is in, the, uh, in the natural order a perverse error. When it is applied to God and the things of God, such as ecumenism, 
and religious liberty. It is a blasphemy against the truth and the holiness of Almighty God. For this reason, we have no truck with the modernists. What is so sad is that not only have millions of Catholics been deceived by the modernists, but that even those who have been shown the light of faith, that is, traditionalists, you might say, in this crisis have not grasped the light but remain in the darkness. I am referring to those who strive to preserve the Catholic faith while accepting at the same time the blasphemy of the relativistic Novus Ordo religion. Those who want to be part of it and work inside of it. We might say of them what is in the prologue of St. John's Gospel, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. These people fail to comprehend that the Novus Ordo religion is darkness and perversion and it was hatched in hell. St. Thomas the Apostle said, My Lord and my God, it is a solemn profession of the objective truth of divine faith. Our Lord responded, Because thou hast seen me, Thomas, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and have believed. And Pilate said, What is truth? when our Lord told him that he came to witness unto the truth. And our Lord said to the apostles, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.